Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Mpidi. I was listening earlier um, uh, when uh, my seniors were saying they were welcoming people who come from far. Well, I'm not one of them. I'm a local man, I'm a UJ man, and a colleague of David, who are both employed at the Faculty of Law of the University of Johannesburg. Welcome to session five. Um, the, uh, in this, uh, during this session, we'll be dealing with developments in the separation of powers in Northern constitutions. We have um, three uh, uh, presentations. The order will change uh, slightly. Uh, members of the panel inform me that they've reorganized things. So firstly, we'll hear from uh, Xavier Philippe, who will be addressing us on the French constitutional perspective on the separation of powers. And this will be followed by a presentation by Vicky Jackson, which will be on separation of powers in the global north and accommodating an old constitution to the 21st century state law and politics. And lastly, we will hear from um, Adrian, Adrian Stone, who will address us on the limits of constitutional evolution, separation of powers under the Australian constitution. Now, each presenter will get 20 minutes um, under strict uh, instructions. <laughs> so um, it will be 20 minutes so that we have enough time for discussions. And um, I have some cards that I'll show you when your time's free. You get five minutes, you get one minute, then you, you wrap up. And the idea is that at the end, then we'll have a nice discussion, uh, you know, at, uh, questions and answers addressed to uh, the members of the panel. Without any waste of time, I would like to invite our first speaker, Xavier Philippe to address us on the French constitutional perspective on the separation of powers. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like first, like uh, other speakers, to thank David for inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, don't worry, I will not bother you with the French uh, constitutional history, but try to sketch out what has been the evolution of the separation of powers in France uh, which is uh, the, the country of uh, Montesquieu. Uh, in fact, I uh, think that you would be very disappointed uh, because uh, the uh, theoretical approach of the separation of powers that was uh, uh, um, made by Montesquieu uh, never matched the reality. Uh, if we go back to what uh, somebody called yesterday the Holy Trinity, uh, the three branches of power, let's say that the idea of Montesquieu that was relevant was to say that the power must stop the power, and that there must be checks and balances to get a real separation of powers. If you look at uh, uh, the French constitutional history, you just realize that uh, this was his wish, but that has never been realized as such. Uh, I will, in my presentation, go for basically four ideas. The first is briefly sketch the separation of powers in France in an historical perspective. Second, is analyzes the uh, uh, current situation under the 1958 Constitution. Third, draw some guidelines and some thoughts about the evolution of the separation of powers. And uh, fourth, see how this type of sharing of powers is spread out in foreign countries. And I will take the example of uh, Tunisia, where I, where I participated to the drafting process of the 2014 Constitution. So uh, to make a long story short, the French po political system uh, was unable, or all the systems were unable to implement and enforce the constitution provisions that were scheduled. In other words, if you look at uh, uh, the, 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 con the French constitutions in the, 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 the 1789 revolutions, you just realize that each time a separation of powers was sketched out within the constitutional text, then the implementation was never realized. Uh, that turned out to be a different story that was uh, the one imagined by those who drafted the Constitution. It was not a, a text problem. Uh, I mean, the, the Constitution in itself were, were democratic. Um, but uh, why is this that never worked? I think that uh, the, the main reason is that uh, most of these Constitutions were drafted in a certain context. The context evolved and the relationship evolved. What is uh, very important to take into consideration here is that if you uh, refer this, uh, this constitution to Montesquieu's doctrine, the judicial power has always been out as being apart uh, from the implementation of the separation of powers doctrine. Uh, from Montesquieu's word, uh, the, the judges were just the mouth of the law. They could not uh, interpret. They could not add something. Uh, 
So the judiciary power in French constitutions has never been one of the uh, strong powers uh, against uh, the legislative or the executive uh, power. And to such an extent that if we look at the uh, uh, history of uh, uh, the Constitution, we just realized that uh, many uh, democratic constitutions turned into dictature, and uh, some uh, started with a parliamentary regime and ended with a semi-presidential regime. So what we uh, uh, can draw from that is that uh, there is a necessity to be very modest about uh, the evolution of the French constitutional systems and the separation of powers. Let's say that uh, the, the, the main change uh, arise, uh, arose, more exactly, uh, in 1875 with the Third Republic, where we can uh, see that the, the, the current separation of powers, let's say the relationship between the executive and the legislative power, uh, started to, to smooth down and to be the main uh, way of dealing uh, with uh, the separation of power. The Third Republic is an interesting one because uh, the balance of powers that was rich during the Third Republic survived the First World War. It's interesting to see that one century later, there are some studies that have been launched on that. Uh, the uh, Third Republic worked perfectly uh, despite the fact that there were a war 100 kilometers from Paris. That is to say, the parliament worked, the uh, government worked, there have been elections, uh, things were uh, running normally despite uh, the context of war. This was not the case, for instance, uh, at the end of uh, the Third Republic when the uh, Second World War spread out. Actually, the separation of power uh, was uh, uh, not any more able uh, to protect uh, the political powers, and uh, that turned into the Vichy regime that everybody knows uh, as being one of the worst that France have known. It's even not considered as one of the Republican uh, regime. Funny enough, I was discussing that yesterday with one of the uh, participants that some law professors that were defending the separation of powers just before the Second World War actually backed up uh, a few years later the new regime of Marshal Patton and considered that the confusion of powers was probably the best regime. So we have once again to be, remain very modest on that point. Um, what I can uh, sketch out from that and that is true uh, from uh, the Third Republic, the Fourth Republic, and the Fifth Republic, that many features of the separation of powers uh, should be uh, analyzed uh, uh, in context. And uh, if you have to understand what is really a separation of, of powers at a certain time, you have to take into consideration some legal issues and some non-legal issues. Many features uh, that explain the, the, the separation of powers and the balance of powers are to be found not necessary within the Constitution and not within the chapter of the separation of powers. Such uh, uh, questions like electoral systems, political parties, uh, regulations, or opposition rights are also uh, quite often explaining what the separation of powers is. And uh, despite uh, the uh, dispensation of power that you can find in a specific chapter of the Constitution, if you uh, have an, uh, an overall uh, analysis of the Constitution and subsequent texts, then you can have a better idea of what the separation of powers is uh, really. Uh, some other factors are not legal and uh, will turn to sociological, political, such as working methods, personal factors such as charisma, internal uh, 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 competition within political parties. So, uh, in fact, the separation of powers is never in a country like France uh, uh, staying at the same level. It's dynamic. It's moving on down. It depends who is elected, uh, how the, the, the power is exercised, uh, and so on. And this gives the impression that the separation of power depends from those who use the Constitution. Co th 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 this could be uh, summarized in a word. Constitution is uh, a text. One size does fit all. But afterwards, how do you uh, use this Constitution is a matter that will vary uh, during uh, the, the various uh, periods of, of, of the political regime. Uh, if we look at the 1958 constitution, that is uh, the current constitution, this is an ex interesting example of what I mentioned regarding the flexibility of the doctrine of separation of powers. Uh, I should say that the practice of a separation of powers has dramatically changed since the beginning of the 1958 constitution. And I just would like to give you uh, a few reasons why this has happened. First, in 1958, this constitution was supposed to be an interim constitution. It was supposed to resolve a post-colonial crisis, the Algerian War, and the separation of powers that was designed at that stage was made to resolve the crisis. 
Funny enough, 50 years later, well, and 60 years later, it's still on. Uh, I, I, the, the 1958 constitution was also a constitution in which you had no place for a constitutional court or the judiciary, very few. And if you look at the evolution of the 1958 constitution, that changed dramatically. It went through all kind of political crisis. Uh, the, the constitution was tailor-made for its uh, founder, General de Gaulle. And in fact, uh, because uh, of many factors, uh, this uh, constitution survived. And I think it survived because it was suffered enough to be amended and to be transformed. We call it still the 1958 Constitution, but two-thirds of the text is not anymore from this, the original text. So it shows that the separation of powers uh, is something that has to be adapted to uh, be uh, understood and to, to, to survive and uh, to make the Constitution uh, a living instrument. If I'm turning right now on the uh, issues uh, regarding uh, the uh, uh, separation uh, of powers and uh, uh, the 1958 constitution, it can be said that uh, this constitution was able to accommodate all kinds of regimes, parliamentary regimes, semi-presidential regimes, uh, uh, whatever has been the, 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 the shareholders or the, the power holders, the, the gaps uh, between the dispensation of powers uh, have been key element to explain that this uh, work. And I want here to point out a few uh, elements that are, in my opinion, very important, not only for France, but for many countries to understand the uh, uh, um, um, uh, separation of power. The, the first one is the electoral system. The majoritarian system in France led to a position where each time uh, a, a president has been elected, he has been able to get a majority in parliament. So in fact, you should not look at the opposition between the, the, the legislative power and the executive power, but rather between the majority and the opposition. And then, uh, if we have to think of, about the, the, the renewal of the separation of power, maybe uh, it should be directed uh, to uh, the opposition rights and what kind of checks and balances the opposition uh, is able to uh, lead when it comes to the exercise of power. The other point uh, that I already mentioned, but which is in my opinion very important, is uh, the possibility of organizing presidential elections and parliamentary elections in, in a certain order. Uh, if you elect first the president, you can be sure that the majority that will be granted later on will be a majority of the president. So that makes things stable. I'm not saying that for a sharing of powers this is ideal, but uh, once again, it's a question between majority and opposition. Um, the, the third point, which is, in my opinion, very interesting to look at when we speak about uh, uh, separation of powers, is the, constitution, the possibility of constitutional amendment. If you cannot amend the constitution, you cannot make, make it a living instrument. Then you need a judge, a constitutional judge, or you need another body to be able to make the constitution a living instrument. That could be constitutional conventions. That could be the court. But if the constitutional amendment is possible, like it is in France, so you, each time you, you, the, the, the context is changing, the constitution is adapting to this context. And I think this is also food for thought regarding the evolution of uh, uh, the constitutional amendment. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, to, 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 to launch a few ideas on, on this evolution of the separation of power, I think that constitutional adjudication has become a, a reality in, in France and in, in, in many European countries, but that came very late. If we come back to Montesquieu, we actually implemented the idea of a real judiciary power able to counteract at, after the Second World War. And France was probably one of the last one to implement this constitutional adjudication, following probably uh, uh, the German and the Italian example. Uh, and uh, 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 Rainer Arnold spoke about that yesterday. I, I won't uh, dig, uh, dig into that. Then uh, <coughs> uh, that changed, in my opinion, the, the, the separation. Finally, I would like to, to pay uh, uh, the, uh, attention to uh, the dissemination of uh, the French model of separation of power in other countries, and especially in Francophone Africa. Um, the, 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 the French system has been widespread uh, after the decolonization process because uh, of the, what I called a colonial <coughs> effort. That is to say that when the decolonization process happened, France sold the 1958 constitution to all, all former uh, colonies, more or less. That has uh, evolved in, in a very, very, uh, uh, in very various ways, depending on the countries, but there has been a, pheno a phenomenon of imitation 
of, uh, after the decolonization process. And then you had a second effect, which was the rejection of the French model for various reasons, political, legal, uh, many of them uh, saw that in, in, in the French system a system that was not uh, a working one. And uh, uh, then the, the, the effect of constant borrowing has been uh, uh, slowed down, uh, let's say, after the, the 80s or, or the 90s. But let me tell you about an example. I live the three past years, which is Tunisia, uh, where Tunisia has adopted a new constitution after the Jasmine Revolution in 2011 and uh, had a chance to, to participate to the uh, drafting process of this Tunisian constitution and to the issue of separation of powers. The separation of powers uh, in uh, Tunisia uh, after the revolution was seen as one of the major reasons for the new constitution. The previous one, the 1959 constitution based on the French model, was a, a, a presidential model. But the presidential model gave rise to the, uh, the dictatorship of Ben Ali. And uh, after, I just remember in 2011, nobody wanted anymore a semi-presidential regime or a presidential regime. Everybody advocated for a parliamentary regime. And then the, the, the process, the constant drafting process went on, went on, and the parties and the political parties started to split and not to agree uh, uh, one with each other. So I, I attended that and uh, I saw that suddenly they came back with the idea that there should be an elected president, that the president is important in Tunisia because they need a face, they need a chief, they need to see somebody who is a power. So at the end of the day, uh, the constitution, without reference to other type of constitutions regarding this precise aspect, went back nearly to the point it was in 1959. That is to say that if you compare the 2014 constitution to the, uh, the, to the, the 1959 constitution, you see that there is directly elected president that has the legitimacy of the people. There is a parliamentary, a semi-parliamentary regime where the parliament is elected with a prime minister. But uh, the preeminence within the uh, two heads of the executive is granted to, 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 the, to, to the president. So my question is, how a country who rejected the, the former system uh, landed in a system that is exactly or nearly exactly the same. I'm saying nearly because, uh, to be uh, honest, the big change is the institution of a constitutional court, and this constitutional court that is not yet set up is uh, the, the, the major question. Who will uh, be uh, appointed? Who will work within the constitution? And there, there is a big debate because the judiciary, especially in Tunisia, is very conservative. So they fear that uh, instead of having a dynamic approach of the constitution protecting rights and freedoms that have been entrenched into the Bill of Rights, uh, they will uh, slow down uh, the, the, the process. So uh, this is something to, 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 to follow in, 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 the, in, in the future uh, year. Um, so um, the, uh, to conclude uh, to my presentation, I would like to, to share with you a few, few ideas mixing my presentation and what has been said yesterday. The first is that the core idea of separation of power did not uh, disappear functionally. In, in a sense, you know, there is always a need for identifying who proposes, who decides, who implements, who controls. And uh, I've not heard, maybe uh, this is food for discussion, somebody uh, that changed my mind yesterday uh, to change this idea that uh, this function of the separation of powers exists. What has changed probably and it's still discussed is who are the stakeholders or the part holders. Uh, and that aspect, we spoke, uh, we spoke about the fourth branch, we spoke about private powers, we spoke about private person, we spoke also, and I think it's very important, of addition of new sources of thought and their places within the hierarchy of norm. Somebody briefly mentioned yesterday the Sharia law, and that was, for instance, a big debate into the, uh, uh, the, the, the drafting process of the Constitution. I've got to say, it's, too, it's even less. It's on discriminants. Um, and the Sharia law was a big debate because the question was to know where to place in the hierarchy of non the Sharia law. If you place it uh, customary law uh, uh, as a source, an ordinary source of law that has to respect the Constitution, then there is no problem. But if you start to see the Sharia law as being over the Constitution, that it, it's a case for in Iran, or it was a case in Yemen, uh, then uh, you have a challenger to the constitution, and you have a new uh, type of, of source and of powers. Then I think that uh, who decide, who control, uh, it, it's a question uh, that has to be completely revised. Um, and uh, finally, and that's more a question than an answer, 
uh, and I, I, I say that with, with a great humility. Uh, for me, uh, the, the, the separation of powers, at, at least in France, was seen as a way of promoting democracy rather than human rights. The human rights issue that David mentioned yesterday in his presentation uh, was not seen as a major purpose of separation of powers. Uh, we wanted separation of powers to prevent one power to supersede the others. Okay? The, the, the issue of protection of human rights was an other issue. But I think that uh, what you mentioned yesterday is uh, really worthy to think about. Because uh, if we look at a separation of powers as a tool, and as a, a, a major justification for promoting human rights, then we have to rethink a number of things that I mentioned. I thank you for your patience. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.